Okay, welcome everyone to another webinar brought to you by Optionslam.com. Please read and understand the CFTC rule before you risk your hard-earned money in the markets. Our disclaimer tells you that we are not licensed financial advisors. We are not registered investment advisors. We do not provide investment nor we do we provide financial advice, nor do we make investment recommendations. Instead, these webinars are provided to you for educational purposes only. Please read and understand the disclaimer. By attending these webinars, you hereby agree to our disclaimer. I am Marco, and this is my email address, optionslam.com at gmail.com. Please feel free to reach out to me at optionslam.com at gmail.com. Let's uh, get logged into the website here and hide the sidebar menu. I'll blow this up one notch. And uh, we are going to jump right in to the stock screener and see what's on our plate for this week. So if I use my generic screener, it comes up with a lot of stocks that meet my minimal amount of criteria up here. Too many stocks to choose from. And therefore, I'm going to just skinny that down by um, tightening up my criteria just a little bit. What I've got here is looking out for one week from today. So anybody who's having earnings within one week of today, I've got it already narrowed down to stocks that, uh, that offer weekly options only rather than all stocks or stocks with options. So I, I've got it with stocks with weekly options. So if they don't have weekly options, they're not, um, they're, they're, they've been filtered out. Um, I'm going to I'm going to bump this up to a $30 minimum um, stock price. And I'm going to bump this up to a 3 million uh, average daily volume. So that's going to uh, give us a little bit more liquidity and a little slightly higher stock price. And that took us down to 47 stocks. Now, I did get a couple emails about people who wanted to... Um, uh, look at a few different stocks and um, but let me ask you guys uh, and girls what stocks are you interested in trading this week what is on your list now I'm going to I'm not going to restrict you to the stocks that are on this list because there's there's quite a few here but you know we've got big tech names uh, announcing this week um, there's all a lot of other um, sectors represented here, okay? PayPal's financial, um, BP is uh, oil, uh, McDonald's is the, the hamburger sector. Uh, actually, a lot of people think of McDonald's as being more of a real estate stock. You know, McDonald's, uh, a, a, a great portion of their um, asset value is in ownership of real estate. Uh, they've got the highest, most visible properties in every city around the world. And um, those are expensive properties. Uh, let's see, uh, Corning, we've got uh, Visa back into financials. And then we start, we start to look at, uh, you know, tech, AMD, uh, the chip sector, not a lot in chips this week, I don't think. Um, uh, let's see. Let's just, let me just point out. Uh, someone wanted to trade, sent me an email uh, about, uh, let's go with, let's look at CMG, but, but no bias represented. So what you guys can do is send me an email, optionslam.com and gmail.com, with the stocks that you're interested in trading in. Even if you have a strategy that you're interested in uh, getting my opinion on, give me your strategy. You can do that right now in the questions box. Um, 
We've got Mondelez and Google. Google, of course, is uh, you know one of the kingpins in the uh, um, the Sacred Seven. <clears throat> um, certainly, technology. Uh, let's see, uh, health sector. Um, uh, SMCI. Uh, oh yeah, super microcomputer for sure. Technology. That one's been a wild ride lately, right? Um, let's see, Starbucks, Roku, MST, or Matt. Uh, so this is really now more of a, uh, this is very highly correlated to uh, Bitcoin, okay? Bitcoin or the, um, uh, of okay, so we got Microsoft, Meta, tech, tech, big tech, big tech, um, insurance, uh, cars, eBay. I'm going to call that. Uh, I'm going to call that technology. It's the retail sort of, so to speak. Uh, coin, of course, is Bitcoin um, related and correlated. Um, health sector, biotech, so to speak. Okay. So there's a lot of sectors being represented, but the point is that it is big time technology, okay? Roblox, CMCSA, um, uh, still some financials. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, ConocoPhillips is uh, oil, some oil mixed in. I mean, we're all over the place here, but the big, some of the big seven, right? Many of the big seven are reporting this week. This should move the markets. Now, what if we get reports of uh, some of them are good, some of them are bad? You know, of course, that's going to uh, wash things out. But um, uh, if, the tech, if the big tech all come in, uh, or most of them come in with positive results and positive reactions to their results, this week's earnings is really critical to what the the immediate and upcoming future is going to be for the overall market. Okay, so I don't have anybody. Um, with any stocks that they're interested in trading. Okay. Well, I'll take a look at the ones that came in by email, which were just a few. Um, we've got a bullish. Uh, we've got a bullish bias on PayPal. Okay, so PayPal is right here at the top of our list, and that's going to happen tomorrow before the open. You see, there's the earnings date. PayPal tomorrow before the open. And uh, as I hover my mouse over PayPal, we get this pop-up that gives us some, some, some very basic, very quick look at what have some of the most recent earnings been and the reaction to those earnings um, in percentage terms of the stock, percentage of the stock price, in terms of the change but between this is the one-day change between the pre-earnings announcement and the one day change um, after the earnings came out. So uh, predominantly PayPal has lately, finally, you know, been in an uptrend and uh, we've got a, um, a bearish bias. So uh, let's take a look and the way we're gonna do that is we'll just right click on PayPal and open that link in a new tab. And Now we are on the PayPal. The black bar has now turned to the PayPal uh, stock specific pages. So these, all these pages are the are the pay. We are on the earnings history page. We'll scroll down to the table, and we saw that pop up that came up in the stock screener that illustrated these results right here. 
these top four, those mo four most recent earnings, but now we can see a lot more. In fact, we have four pages of results uh, that come back on PayPal. Um, I don't, you know, the, that data is, is uh, worth looking at and it's uh, worth considering the historical data, but you know, this first page takes us back to 2022, and this is the most recent, therefore, in my mind, the most relevant information. Uh, we, let's, let's just scroll down a little bit and see, uh, get, get, try and get the big picture here on PayPal. What's going on with PayPal? Where do we sit now compared to, you know, historical uh, data and um, statistics? And um, this is our EVR history. Um, PayPal, as you can see, uh, we used to have an EVR that, let's see, uh, 2.7, as low as 2.3, you know, uh, 2.5. And, uh, the, you know, and these give you a little date there. So we're going back to 2017 here. Every quarter, the EVR earnings volatility rating, by the way, is uh, you can go to the help pages and learn more about earnings volatility ratings. All right. And, um, EVR ranged from uh, 0 to 10, 10 being the highest, and um, we consider anything 4 or above to be pretty high EVR, okay? It's, I don't, you don't want, you got to be really careful if you're starting to sell uh, short, naked uh, straddles on um, EVR stocks that have EVRs uh, above 3.5. Those can start getting wild now. So where's PayPal now? It's at a 3.7, almost to that threshold that I call four. I call that, that's a high EVR. Anything above four is getting, um, you know, like I say, a little bit concerning to be selling naked straddles or strangles. Not that you couldn't or shouldn't do it, but you you need to be aware of that particular strategy exposes you to unlimited risk and a, and a very large move. And that's what earns a stock, a high EVR, is a history of very large moves. So a 3.7 currently is right there almost approaching. Now let's see what, what causes PayPal to have an EVR of 3.7, almost to that 4.0 EVR threshold. Well, it's moves like this. One day moves. This is the one trading day after an event, after an earnings event. And that's exactly what EVR me uh, measures, is how sensitive to a earnings event is my stock, in this case, PayPal. It moved last quarter as much as 10.38% inside that one day, a 10% move. By the end of that day, it was up 8%, okay? Um, it gapped up 6% from the previous day's close of 58.94. It gapped up and opened up 6.5% and then climbed all the way up to 10 and settled at 8.58. So this is just a little insight as how to read this data here, okay? Um, this one is a lot more subdued. Here's, a, here's one where it gapped down 8% and then continued to close down even further at 11%. Uh, this is, again, more subdued. 12% uh, down at the lows, at the lows. The maximum was down 12.4. Another big 12% move down. So these are some really negative, uh, big big moves here. Um, uh, not so big, and uh, almost almost non almost didn't change. And then a big move in the up direction. Okay, so we have a trader who has suggested that uh, PayPal. He would like to look at PayPal on the bearish side, and. Um, Let's take a look at the price chart. The price chart is anything but bearish, okay? If you look at this price chart, it is anything but bearish. 
And um, uh, now, PayPal, let's look at the bigger picture here. I'm going to flip over to my uh, brokerage uh, charts because I'm just a lot more familiar with using those. And um, I can navigate uh, uh, these uh, um, more efficiently than using that uh, trading view chart that's uh, that we provide at optionslam.com. But for convenience sake, uh, uh, we do have those charts at optionslam. By the way, those charts, let me just jump back right back there again. This is one day delayed. This is the last day here. This showing is uh, last Friday. Let me, uh, this, this is last Friday. If you want an up-to-date, um, even right down to the current minute, you can click this live interactive chart link right here, and that'll take you, that'll take you to a pop-up with live interactive charts that are uh, uh, interactive in the way that you can control, you can add uh, <clears throat> all kinds of uh, indicators, et cetera, and control the time frame that you're looking at. So let me take this out to, because PayPal is an interesting case. I think it was down something like, uh, I want to say 70%. Um, now here's a three year weekly chart. Here is only uh, uh, three years ago, trading at the 233 zone. And uh, oh yeah, uh, right. So my memory of 70% down is about correct uh, in rough terms. And uh, it came down hard and sharp. I don't really know what caused this uh, bearish uh, move in uh, PayPal. But it's, it really worked hard over the last couple of years to establish what looks to be a bottom, a low of $50.25. Wow, from 233. And it may have been higher than that if I go back further in time. I'm only back three years, so it may have been higher than that. I could easily go back further. But... Looking at the price chart and just looking at it from a technical perspective, um, uh, as far as and in terms of um, price action, lower highs, higher uh, lower highs, uh, lower lows, higher highs, higher higher uh, Support and resistance is, I guess, what I'm trying to say. So I'm just going to put my crosshairs at what I can see that looks to be a double top right here on these two huge weekly bars. And price uh, made kind of a double top right there and sold off from, from that. It made this uh, all or very, very long time low. Certainly, that's the three-year low the three-year low of $50.25. And then uh, right here uh, was a very minor high, uh, a new lower low, and then, you know, a, a temporary break through that high, but it couldn't hold inside of that week, okay? And uh, uh, testing of that high all through this period, but only recently, only since the last earnings event, have we been able to break that high. And not only that, but now we're through this double top, this double top that I referenced earlier. And now we're challenging this previous high, or we're at least approaching this previous high. This would be what I would call the next resistance area uh, to anticipate. And if I look at the high of that bar, I'm just going to call it, I'm just going to call it about $88.53, okay? I'm going to call it about $88, $88, dollars somewhere in that zone. Well, let's take a look now at uh, the implied move. What? Now, we have a trader who's bearish on this, looking for a bearish uh a bearish reaction to the earnings event. Uh, but let's take a look at what the implied move is. So 
we're here at the uh, earnings history page. I'm going to go to the implied move weekly page. And um, of course, all of this data that's up here in this top of shaded area is available on all of these pages. But I wanted to dig a little bit deeper into the implied move weekly. So uh, the implied move weekly is 8%, and the implied move monthly is about 10%, OK? So, so let's say, uh, uh, let's see, about 10%. All right, let, OK, so let's see. All right, let me get back to my train of thought on that. So 10% move on a stock that is currently trading at uh, $83 would be an $8 move. An $8 move in the upwards direction uh, would be uh, about $91. Well, that's going to put us above that $88.89 uh, resistance level that I pointed out. So uh, the implied move, I'm just, what I'm trying to get at here uh, is that the implied move closely correlates this earnings implied move closely correlates with where resistance is in the price chart okay and if i go to the previous resistance prior to that that takes me to the 92 93 let's see about 92 dollar zone okay the 92 dollar zone and uh again an eight dollar move from where we're trading here today uh, 83.50, and uh, a 10% move, which would be an $8 move basically, takes us right to, it takes us through that resistance and right to that next resistance level. Or uh, re I call it resistance because it is a previous high from which price is sold off from there after hitting that high two weeks in a row there. All right. So uh, I think it's interesting to compare implied moves to where resist support and resistance is in the price chart. Okay, and on the other on the other side, an eight dollar move from the eighty three takes us down to seventy five. Okay, an eight dollar move from the eighty three price zone where we're sitting at currently. An $8 move takes us down to the 75 zone. And if I just put my cursor, uh, uh, my crosshairs at the 75, right around in that zone, you can see that also was a, let me, let me zoom in on that, um, right there. No, that's not it, right here. Okay, the 75 zone, this previous resistance right here was 74 okay so as price was coming up it hit a resistance level from which it sold off but only for a very short period of time it looks like about about something less than a month where uh that zone of 74 to 75 dollars uh, was a was a resistance level sold off from there but this uh, uh, September, this, the second week of September, uh, powered up and broke through that, and we've been on an onward climb since. So, again, just referencing implied moves versus support and resistance in the price chart. And is there a correlation? Can we find something that makes sense? I'm, I think what it does for me doing this study and thinking about it in this, these terms is that it, that it uh, supports the market's anticipation of where the price is, uh, the, it supports the market's anticipation of implied move, okay? I think it gives more credibility to using implied move. Now, if you guys have been around and uh, attended my webinars before, you know that I, I design almost all my option strategies around implied moves, okay? And uh, so I just wanted to bring that to the table. So let's do it. Let's go to the, uh, 
Um, I use the Analyze tab because it, it gives me the same exact same options chain and the ability to trade uh, uh, as the trade tab. So I don't even bother with the trade tab. I don't know if there's any advantages to using the trade tab because I can do everything from, unless you could tell me if there's something that you can do from the trade tab that I can't do from the Analyze tab, let me know. Type it in the chat. Let me know what's what's up with that because, uh, all right. So um, earnings is tomorrow before the open. The implied move is about 8% on the front week weekly. Uh, what does 8% of a $83 stock uh, translate to? Uh, about a... Six or seven dollar move. Let's see. Eight times. Uh, let's see. It's an eighty-three dollar stock uh, times eight percent is about a six dollar six to seven dollar move. Okay. So that is suggesting that the uh, market is pricing in a six to seven dollar move in either direction. Um, that's the front week weekly. Now the the other implied move that I was looking at is based on the monthlies, which in, the, in that case, we would go out to the November 15th. So the, uh, the, the front, and this is very typical, that the implied move for the weeklies is going to be the majority. It's going to be the bulk of the monthly move, okay? Because the biggest part of the 10% move expected in the, uh, November 15th regular monthlies, third Friday of the month, right? The bulk of that 10% is expected to happen here in this week. That is 8%, okay? So that's very typical. That's expected. That's what, uh, it's very normal. Um, so if we look at that implied move and we suggest a, a bearish trade, um, and, uh, and we're not super bearish looking for any huge move down. Let's think about a, uh, my trader who came with that suggestion did not suggest a strategy. So I'm going to, you know, I think I'm gonna just keep it really simple here. And I'm gonna look at a, uh, a simple, um let's do this let's do a vertical debit spread and then let's compare it to the pros and cons compare it to a selling a credit spread okay both of them will do on the bearish side so let's use the implied move let's let's consider a move down to about, uh, let's see, from 83 down six is gonna take us down to the 77. So what if we bought the vertical spread by a, I'm gonna go analyze by a vertical. Well, a vertical is buy one, sell one. So I'm gonna buy an 83, and since the implied move takes us down to 77, I'm going to go ahead and <clears throat> sell the 77. <clears throat> uh, actually, it's a, we're at 83. I'm going to call it 83.50. I'm going to sell the 77.50. Oh, it says it's not available. Oh, it is not available. Okay, I see that. Sorry. Okay. Back to the 77. That's fine. Okay, so there's buy a vertical spread. Now, why not just buy the the uh, 83 and, and call it good? Well, let's look at just buying the 83. Let's do that comparison first. If we just buy the 83, uh, it costs $335. Well, the market is implying a move of uh, about six points. And the one thing we know about um, implied moves is that most of the time the market gets it right and most of the time markets move within the implied move they don't usually move beyond the implied move certainly oftentimes they do but 
as in a bell curve, 68% of the time, markets move with inside, inside the implied move. So why not go with the probabilities and save a little money? And rather than risking $335, we could just go to the implied move. Since we don't expect price to move beyond that, and bring in a dollar of credit against our risk of 335, bringing our total risk down to 229. I think it's very commonsensical. Besides that, let's look at, I unchecked the vertical here. Let's look at just buying the 335. And let's take a look at uh, what the uh, uh, Greeks are for this particular strategy. Um, the Greeks are, Obviously, we've got a negative delta when we buy a put. We, we, for every dollar price goes down in the stock, uh, this position will profit $46. Okay, it's a 46 negative delta. Um, the theta position in this, uh, in this, uh, uh, just this long put is kind of hurting us big time going to lose $44 a day to time time decay uh as we get started in this and vega also is working against us because this position is exposed to implied volatility crush and what happens at earnings iv crushes so we're going to lose $3.53 for every point of IV crush. And believe me, that's substantial. So uh, the amount of IV crush anticipated here is very substantial because the front week weeklies have a 97 IV. And, um, uh, and we can go in. Let's see. Do I have this set up? What am I looking at? Open interest. Delta volume. Um, let me change that to one that has an implied volatility. I'm in my simulated trading here uh, right now because uh, my charts are all marked up in my live trading platform on many of these stocks because I trade them often. So uh, let's see. Implied volatility, yes, 90, 97 on that, 83 put, 97 IV, and then this is a, this is a uh, uh, formula that just says that, just says that uh, the options that expire November 1st are at, through some kind of a composite formula. <clears throat> uh, uh, we're going to call it an average of 96. And that's looking at not just specifically the 83 at the money options. It's looking at the IV of all of these different options. So every option has its own IV. And the Thinkorswim does, as do many brokers, is provide us a number that um, we'll call it the composite number, which I use extensively, the composite number, because it's just a lot simpler to think of the IV and this week's options as being higher than the following week, or uh, for, for example. Okay, back to that comparison. In risk profile, that's what that long put looks like, and, and uh, uh, but I'm just trying to illustrate why would I do this uh, vertical instead of just buying the put? And uh, because of the Greeks, and uh, so when I when I do the vertical, when I add selling the 77, it reduces my risk. I don't expect price to go beyond $77 on the downside anyway. So why not collect the $100 for selling that 77? So it reduces my risk by 100 bucks. And what else does it do? Let's look at it comparatively in terms of the Greeks. Now, I don't make as much money for every dollar that price goes down, but I still 
have the potential to make $370 of profit on a $230 risk. So that's what? Uh, 150% profit? Risking $230 to make $370? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's... Uh, it's. It's 150% or somewhere in that neighborhood uh, profit against risk. So it's a great risk to reward uh, strategy if held to this blue line is if held to the end of the week. Okay, two options expiration, which is this Friday. And what else do we have in Greece? Well, instead of losing $44 a day, I think it was. Let's go back and take a look. Yep, $44. Instead of losing $44 a day to time decay, now we're only losing $15 a day to time decay, okay? Uh, of course, if price goes in the right direction, well, then we're not, you know, our net gain from delta uh, and uh, minus theta is still net positive, okay? And instead of losing uh, to IV crush, at the rate of, I think it was four point, okay, uh, it's 3.53 at the moment, 3.53 Vega, and instead of losing 3.53 for every point of IV crush, $3.53 for every point of IV crush, and again, that's substantial. Now we're only losing one, one point, okay? Now, what is the IV crush again? Okay, uh, good question. Let's go back to the, uh, okay, so IV is currently at 96, and um, IV is going to crush quickly down into these, these numbers that are out here three months and beyond, okay? That's where IV is going to crush you. It's going to crush from 96 down to 40, to the 40 zone. That's about a 55 point IV crush. So it's substantial. It's substantial. If you're going to lose a dollar for every point of IV crush, that's $55 if, if indeed IV crushes down to the 40 zone. So again, um, uh, we, you know, a positive Vega trade is, um, is is not conducive to uh, a hold through the earnings event, but in, in in and that's why I strongly you know there's a webinar uh, that I did uh, I think it was a couple of years ago uh, you if you go to Option Slam resources and Option Slam webinars you can screw, you can just search you know use your Use your find key uh, up here and find uh, a, a webinar that I did said stop buying calls and puts. I think that was the name of the webinar. Stop buying calls and puts. And I talk about a lot of the same thing that I'm referring to here. Um, all right. So now I've given you a lot of reasons uh, why you don't want to do a debit spread. Although I believe that the, by doing a debit spread here is much better than just buying a call, just buying a put here. Do the debit spread rather than just do the um, uh, buying a long call. Let's now compare that to another bearish strategy. And that is let's compare the buying a debit spread to selling a credit spread. Now there's pros and cons. But. Let's take a look. How would we do a credit spread? Um, again, we'll just to, for comparison purposes, we're going to uh, use the same front week weeklies. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and instead of, let's see, I'm going to go out to the 84 because price is halfway between 83 and 84. I use the 83 which was 50 cents out of the money on this side. So I'm going to go to the 84, which is 50 cents out of the money. I'm just talking in round terms, round numbers. I'm rounding this to 83.50 in my head here. So I'm going to go to the 84 to try to keep things consistent here. 
and I'm going to sell the 84. And we're going to go $6 out of the money, which is the implied move. Okay. Same implied move we used on the other side. And we're going to, for protection, we're going to buy the 90. So we're going to create this credit spread here, which brings in a credit of $2.07. So what's the max profit on this debit spread? It is the difference between the strikes minus the debit. That's the max you can make. The difference between the strikes, 83 to 77, is $6. So the most I can make is $6, but I have to pay for the strategy. So it's $6 less the 228. That gave us that 370 or whatever it was, right? A maximum profit. What is the maximum profit of a credit spread? The maximum profit of the credit spread is the credit that you receive. It's a lot easier to calculate, isn't it? You just look at the credit you receive, and that's the maximum amount of money you can make. What is the risk? <clears throat> the risk is kind of the opposite of the formula that I just described um, for the debit spread. The formula for the debit spread to figure out the maximum um, uh, a profit is the difference between the strikes less the debit. Well, what's the, this is the, the kind of the opposite kind of a trade, right? It's a credit spread. So here, what we need to, we know what the maximum profit is. It's $2. What's the risk though? Well, the risk is the difference between the strikes, which is $6 less the credit. So it's just kind of the reverse. It's, it's the reverse of the debit spread, okay? The way we calculate maximum profit and maximum risk. So let's look at that debit spread. I'm gonna do something that's fun and interesting here in a moment, okay? In a moment, as soon as we get through this, we're going to look at something. We're going to convert this whole thing into another strategy. But let's look at this just alone and by itself. So um, this is the credit spread. I've unchecked the debit spread. We now can see it in, in graphical terms that the max profit is the $2.06. You can see that right down, down here. Two, it just changed to 204. The credit received 204. That's the max profit. The max risk is the, I'll just say it in round term, round numbers, $400. So now we're risking 400 to make 200. So here you might say, well, geez, I like the risk reward of that debit spread better. And that is what we're doing here. We're, we're comparing some of the pros and cons of debit spread versus credit spread as a through the earnings strategy. Through the earnings meaning earnings is tomorrow. We're going to put the strategy on today. Earnings comes out in the morning, and we're holding the strategy through the earnings. We got our fingers crossed. We got our toes crossed. We got our legs crossed. We've got everything crossed. We're double crossed. Uh, we even got our eyes crossed, and we're hoping that uh, with this strategy that the market goes down. Because if it goes up, we're going to lose money. Okay? So, but one of the advantages to the debit spread versus the credit spread is that the risk-reward ratio seems better, right? Because it's risking what was it risking? $227 to make 150% profit. Here we're risking $400 to make only 50% profit. But, so why else would I want to consider the credit spread over the debit spread? Well, let's look at the Greeks again. The credit spread gives us that same negative 24, 25 delta. 
So it's going to earn money in that same at that same rate of return. I'm skipping past gamma because gamma has a very close relative. It is a first cousin to delta. It's the speed at which delta moves because delta doesn't stay 25 uh, uh, consistently from here till Friday. It increases and it increases at a rate of speed which is calculated by gamma. But just to keep the conversation a little more simple, I'm going to skip past gamma and uh, we'll just call it, uh, uh, you know, when price goes to uh, just a, one more thing on gamma. If price goes down $1, we're not only going to pick up $25 of profit, we're going to pick up another dollar. We're going to actually pick up $26 of profit. And then as price continues down the next dollar, the delta is going to now be up to, it's, it's going to be a bigger number. It's going, to, it's going to be a bigger number as price continues down. Delta goes up, gamma goes up, and uh, our rate of profit increases as the price goes in our favor. Uh, if price goes against us, well, then the opposite is true. Theta, now this is an advantage to this strategy over the debit spread. Now I'm making money in time decay as opposed to the debit spread. And I got negative vega. And now I'm making money as implied volatility crushes. So there are some advantages to the credit spread, even though the risk reward ratio didn't look quite as much fun as the debit spread. Okay. So now what my surprise is, is to turn this whole concept, this whole thing into a new strategy rather than a debit spread or a credit spread. How about we do both? And if we do both, this is considered a risk reversal. If we look at doing the bearish debit spread. Now, the, to do a risk reversal, I really want, the best way I like to do risk reversals, and I think this is a great strategy, to do the risk reversal, I really want to manipulate these strikes so that my credit is at least equal to my debit. So I'm not just going to leave these raw the way I had originally designed them. I'm going to tweak one or both of these strategies. I either want to make this debit spread a little cheaper, or I want to make this credit spread a little uh, better of a credit. So I'm going to try making this a little bit cheaper by going like this. I'm instead of buying the 83 and selling the 77, um, what if I sell the 76? Oh, wait a minute. Did I think, am I thinking backwards here? Uh, I'm doing puts, so I got to go, uh, let's see, I did the 77. Oh, yeah, I want, I, I'm, I'm thinking backwards here. Uh, I got to do the 78. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Got to stand on my head sometimes, too. Um, uh, because when you're doing puts, of course, I, I want to bring in more credit. And the 78 is closer to where stock is trading, so that's going to be a better credit. Sell the 78 rather than the 77. So now uh, all I had to do was tweak that by one strike, okay? And now my credit for the credit spread is bigger by only a couple bucks than the debit for the debit spread. And now if I do both, and they're both bearish strategies, they both want price to go down. So if I do this and add the uh, credit spread, I'm going to just, I'm just going to widen this out so you can see the risk graph a little bit. I want to show you something that, let's see, how do I get rid of that today line? But you can see the expiration line, the blue line, it flattens out here. It flattens out here in the middle 
with this particular configuration so that if price goes the wrong way and it goes up slightly all the way up to this $84 zone, I don't lose any money. So with this risk reversal, and it depends on how you, and I, could, I design these right at the money. I can flatten this out even wider by going out of the money on both sides. And I'll show you that in a moment. In a moment. But uh, what this does is it creates a potential for me to be wrong about direction, but only to a certain point before I start losing money. In this case, it's the 84 strike. So price could actually go from 83 up to 84 and I don't lose any money. Whereas if I do any either one of these and price goes to 84, I lose the max amount, maximum amount in this debit spread. If I just do the credit spread and I'm wrong about direction and price goes up to 84. Well, with the credit spread, actually, the 84 is I, I'm still at maximum profit. So uh, so I, I, I said that incorrectly. Um, the credit spread is good. Uh, uh, the way that it is designed here, up to 84, you, you make maximum profit. And it's not until you get all the way past 85, the amount of the credit, uh, 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 before you are underwater through that zero line. But, uh, uh, but anyway, the general point here is that by doing this, doing both the credit spread and the uh, debit spread, you create a flat spot here where you don't lose any money. You can be wrong about direction. And you can tweak this so that this flat spot is much longer uh, in either direction by, by working with the uh, strikes that you choose to do this. Now, let's now take a look at where are we at with the Greeks for this whole entire position. Well, if we're right about direction, now we've doubled our delta. So we, because we've actually doubled our position, right? We've doubled our position and we've doubled our risk, pretty much doubled our risk because we've got really two positions on to create this, what I call a risk reversal. Now there's other, there's other ways to put on a risk reversal. But this is a very common way to do it with credit and debit spreads, okay? And, uh, uh, but let's look at our Greeks. Delta is doubled. Theta is positive, okay? So we got, we're making money on time decay. Not much, but we're, it's better than being negative uh, theta. And we've totally neutralized our vega. IV crush does not hurt us at all anymore. Okay, so here we have totally neutralized Vega. We've improved our theta position and we've doubled our delta position. We've also doubled our maximum profit and we've doubled our, 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 uh, our exposure to risk. I love the risk reversal. I think it's a fantastic trade for earnings events. It completely erases your, your uh, IV crush. It gives you a positive theta trade, and it gives you the directionality that you wanted. If you're bearish, I strongly consider the bearish risk reversal. If you're bullish, just flip-flop these and do them the other way. All right, everyone, I hope that that uh, was uh, helpful and um, we are hereby out of time. Thanks for being here and uh, look forward to seeing you all in the next webinar. We hope to be here again for you next week. Uh, if you have a stock that you would like to trade it, <clears throat> that has earnings next week, please shoot me an email optionsline.com at gmail.com. Let me know what stocks you're interested in trading. Give me your strategy that you're thinking about employing. I'd be happy to take a look at it and um, critique it for you and possibly improve it for you. 
and uh, if nothing else, point out the pros and cons of your strategy. Otherwise, if you uh, don't have a strategy in mind, but you just have a stock that you're bullish or bearish on, and you have a um, uh, a bias, just give me the stock symbol and your bias. Uh, congratulations to Ciro last week. He was right on uh, it with his bullish big time expectation of of uh, Tesla, and he knocked it out of the ballpark with a huge win. Um, I was very happy to hear that. Thanks, Ciro, for bringing that uh, trade to the table and that opportunity with your uh, excellent directional bias opinion of bullish on Tesla last week. They, uh, they, uh, they knocked it out of the water and so did you. All right. <clears throat> with that, we'll close the meeting. Thanks everyone for being here. We'll see you next week. Uh, goodbye for now and wishing you all good trading.